Uh, welcome this morning. Congratulations, those of you who survived the Metro and were able to wake up early enough to make it to a philosophy conference on a Saturday morning. It's my pleasure to be here. I hope to do a couple things in my talk today. One, I hope to give you a really clear and vivid sense of what philosophers call the problem of evil. Professor Law introduced a version of the problem of evil and argument from evil yesterday. I hope to make it poignant and, and powerful for you. And then what I hope to do is explore at least one of the kinds of responses that philosophers have offered to the problem of evil, the so-called skeptical response or the skeptical theistic response. And I hope to motivate it and defend it in a way that makes it plausible to you. And then we'll end the talk by looking at some objections to it and then you'll have a chance to ask some questions. So let's start. Suppose I ask you whether or not I have a coin in my pocket. What should you believe? You have three options. You could believe that in fact I do have a coin in my pocket. You could hold the belief that I don't have a coin in my pocket. Or you could just be agnostic. You could neither hold the belief that I have a coin nor hold the belief that I don't. Those are the three positions that you could hold on any given belief. So what should you believe about the coin? It seems like the reasonable thing for you to do is to remain agnostic. You shouldn't believe that I do have a coin in my pocket. You shouldn't believe that I don't. You don't have any reasons or evidence one way or the other. And interestingly, what this shows is something like denial is not the default position. We're in the same scenario when it comes to matters of God. You could believe that there is a God. You could believe that there's not a God. Or you could be in between. You could neither hold that there's a, uh, uh, the belief that there's a God nor the belief that there isn't. That's the agnostic position. So theists think that there is a God. Atheists think that there's not a God. Agnostics don't hold a belief either way. And what this shows is that atheism is not a default position. No one is born an atheist. We all come into the world agnostics and we look for reasons to hold the beliefs that we do. We look for evidence, we look for arguments, we look for reasons. And so when it comes to God, we need reasons to be atheists. It's not something that we sort of get on the cheap. And so what would count as a good argument against the existence of God? What would count as a reason to be an atheist? Historically, one of the most prominent reasons for being an atheist has to do with the existence of evil in the world. And that's the kind of argument that I want to try to motivate and sketch for you this morning. But first, about a word about who it is we're talking about. This came up yesterday during the Q&A session for Professor's, Professor Law's talk. The problem of evil isn't a problem for all gods, if you will. It's not a problem for the existence of just any old kind of deity. Consider this guy, Zeus. If you know anything about Greek mythology, it wouldn't be at all surprising if he creates a world that contains the kind of evils that we experience. Zeus isn't a terribly nice guy. He's got motives that run counter to some of his human subjects and so forth. So the argument from evil or the problem of evil isn't a problem for all kinds of divine beings. It's not a kind of argument that would show you that there's nothing out there, that there's no kind of uh, deity whatsoever. You might, however, think that it's a problem for a certain kind of divine being called the God of Michelangelo. So this is a God that is supposed to be perfect in every way. In particular, this is a being that is supposed to be omnibenevolent. He's supposed to be all good. This is a being that always does what he ought to do and perhaps goes above and beyond that and meets some super erogatory um, actions. But furthermore, this is a God that knows everything. This is not the kind of God that gets surprised um, by facts that were out there and yet unknown to her. And lastly, this is supposed to be a God that's very powerful. This is a God that's able to do anything that could be done. You might think that evil is a problem for this kind of God. And so that's the kind of God that I'll refer to for the remainder of the talk when I use the term God. So what's the problem? How can I motivate why the existence of a God like this might be incompatible or surprising given the kind of evils that we see in the world? Well, I'd like you to watch a short skit that I think um, motivates and makes poignant this strangeness 
that, that happens when you think about a God that has these kind of perfections and yet the kind of world that we live in. Take a look at this. If you don't know who Celine Dion is, that's good for you. It was funny to watch your reactions during the video. Uh, some of you are chuckling and wincing. Why on earth would God, a God who knows everything, a God who's able to do anything, why on earth would she purposefully allow people to endure things like childhood cancer, Lou Gehrig's disease, and so forth? It's, this seems like a bizarre conversation for God to have, right, as he's creating the world. Why would God make us endure these kinds of things? Again, maybe it's not strange for Zeus, but if it's God that we're talking about, that's really bizarre. So I think this video sort of helps us to see the angst or, or the level of, of uncomfort that I think we should have, especially if you're a theist, coming into a, a conversation about the kind of evils that are in the world. But of course, we can't just leave it at this level of discomfort um, or this oddness or this kind of prima facie problem. Philosophers prize arguments. So how could we take this initial discomfort and how could we construct a reason or some kind of argument that we might use to leverage ourselves out of athe out of excuse me ad agnosticism and into the camp of atheism? Well, here's an example of a kind of argument that takes this problem of evil and attempts to put it into a clear premise conclusion form for the conclusion that there is no God, for the conclusion that atheism is true. And the argument has two assumptions. The first assumption is just this. If God exists, if there's a God, there would be no evil in the world. But, second assumption, there is, in fact, evil in the world. And so, as a result of premise one and premise two, God doesn't exist. So here's a way of taking that angst that we feel when we watch um, the Mr. Deity conversation and putting it into a clear argument for atheism. Now, as Professor Law mentioned yesterday, very few philosophers find this formulation of the argument persuasive. So even though this is maybe a, a, a fair first pass at trying to put an argument together, very few people find this argument convincing. And the reason they don't find it convincing has to do with this first premise. The first premise is widely seen as being false because it's too broad. It captures any kind of evil that might be out there and that seems to go beyond our evidence. And here's the kind of thing that people offer to try to motivate the falsity of the first premise. I have two little boys, an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. And over the years, um, I've had to take them to the doctor multiple times so that they could uh, receive inoculations. And every time we do so, there's drama. When, they're, when they were really little, it's kicking and screaming. When they're older, it's conversations about why is this necessary, why are you doing this to me, isn't there some other way? But if you know anything about inoculations and the kind of diseases that, um, that are out there, no one, I think, would fault a parent for making her child endure an inoculation. And the idea is really simple. Even though there are some bad things associated with the inoculation, the fear, the pain, and so forth, there's some good thing that comes out of it. And that good thing that comes out of it, if you will, makes the pain worth it. You can't fault the parent for making the, the child endure this pain because it was justifiable given um, the kind of diseases that the child is now protected against. Philosophers have just suggested that the same might be true of God. There might be certain kinds of goods in the world that you just can't get without evils or without the possibility of certain kind of evils. So for example, you might think it's a really good thing to build your own character, to become your own person, to strive and build virtues within yourself. But it's also true that building your own character and striving those ways requires the presence of certain evils. You'll never learn to become courageous if you're never placed in an uncomfortable or a fearful situation, and so forth. So if it's true then that certain goods require certain evils, then we can't fault God for creating a world with those kind of evils in them. After all, 
God wants the world to include these goods. You can't get the goods without the evils, so God had no choice in the matter. Now, you might be thinking this way. You might think, but wait just a minute, Justin. You said earlier that we were talking about the God of Michelangelo and not Zeus, and the God of Michelangelo can do anything. He's omnipotent. And if he's on, omnipotent and can do anything, can't he get us these good things without the evils? The answer depends on whether you think an omnipotent being can do the impossible. And theists have debated this throughout the millennia and, and come down on different sides of the fence. But as it turns out, it doesn't matter how you decide that particular question, there's going to be a kind of problem for this version of the argument from evil. Here's why. Suppose it's true that God can't do the impossible. Then it seems like this objection to the argument from evil is a good one. If there were these goods that you genuinely can't get without certain kinds of evils, and God can't do the impossible, then her hands are bound. God would need to instantiate the evils or the possibility of evils to get the goods. Now imagine the other horn of the dilemma. Suppose God could do the impossible. Well, in that case, Yes, God could produce those goods without the evils, despite the fact that the evils are genuinely necessary for the goods. But now it seems that this argument from atheism is going to be a flop for a different reason. If God can do the impossible, then God can also create a world loaded with evils, despite the fact that that's impossible, given her nature. The argument from evil presupposes that there are certain worlds that are off-limits to the kind of God that we're talking about. And if all of a sudden you remove those limits by thinking God could do anything, including the impossible, well then, among those impossible things are creating a world that's loaded with these pointless evils. So it seems that either way we go on this question of whether or not God can do the impossible, the version of the argument that we just looked at isn't going to work. But we can fix it up. We can fix it up by considering not just any old evil, but evils that are pointless, or as Professor Law puts it yesterday, evils that are gratuitous, evils that don't serve that function of capturing some greater good. So here's the evil, here's the evil argument fixed up then to accommodate that point about what's gratuitous or what's pointless. Now the first premise seems really plausible. If there's a God, then every evil in the world must have a point. God wouldn't have allowed that evil in unless it served some greater purpose. And premise two says, but look, when you look around the world, we see an awful lot of evils that aren't meeting this greater purpose. We see an awful lot of evils that really are pointless. And if there are pointless evils, and if God would ensure that there are no pointless evils, then these two assumptions together do seem to get us a good argument for atheism, a good reason to think that God doesn't exist. So that's, I think, one clear way of sketching a plausible argument from evil, an argument that starts with claims about the bad things in our world and concludes that as a result, God doesn't exist. So how might the theist respond to this kind of argument? Historically, there have been broadly three ways. One way is to deny the second premise of the argument, to say that, in fact, there is no evil. It's to see the world this way. Nothing bad, nothing scary, nothing painful, and so forth. Maybe we think that certain things are evil or bad, but they're not really evil or bad. And if nothing's really evil, then, of course, the second premise of the argument is false and the argument is a failure. St. Augustine might have held something like this when he says that evil isn't its own thing. Evil is merely a lack of something good. It's an absence and not a thing in itself. Spinoza might have held a view like this um, when he says things like evil is an illusion. And if any of you find yourself tempted to the view that morality is something that humans made up that there's no, sort of no deep reality or, or no deep moral reality, then maybe you would be inclined to take this way out of the argument. Just deny that evil is real. The second major way of responding to this argument is what philosophers call a theodicy, 
It's an attempt to explain the evils that we find in the world. And if you can explain that the evils that we see in the world all have a point, then you're in a position to deny the second premise. You can show that the evils in the world are not pointless after all. And if they're not pointless, then of course the argument falls apart. Now there are lots of different explanations that theists have provided over the years as to why the world has evil. Here's an illustration of one of them, and it's the free will theodicy. The idea is that God wants to create a world in which humans have significant free will. Significant free will requires that you have a variety of different avenues, options that are open to you, and it requires that some of those avenues be good and some of those avenues be bad. And it's a good thing, we think, for people to exercise their free will, for people to choose rightly and choose wrongly and have those opportunities, but God couldn't ensure that we always choose rightly. So it doesn't look like God could create a world in which there was significant free will, and yet there was no evil. With significant free will comes the risk that people choose badly. And when people choose badly as a result, others sometimes suffer. So this is an example of a kind of theodicy, an explanation for the evils in our world. That's the second kind of response then to the argument from evil. Now that's not the response that I want to focus on for the remainder of our time this morning. Um, I think the, the response that there's no evil in the world is very interesting and the, the theodicy type response where you try to explain the evils in our world, uh, that's a very interesting response as well. But I want to focus on a third kind of response, one that's skeptical. I, don't, I want to do this for two reasons. One, I think this is an interesting and plausible response to the argument from evil. But two, I think this response is actually very common. When I speak with others who are interested in this issue or when I speak with students, students are very quick to raise this kind of skepticism about the argument from evil. In fact, it's so popular that it finds itself into everyday pop culture, and I want to show you a quick example. This comes from comedian Louis C.K. in a recent introduction um, to a Saturday Night Live skit. Check it out. So, I think there's something right about that response. The fact that you can't see something isn't always evidence that it isn't there. And this is the kind of skeptical response then that some theists have offered to the argument from evil. It sometimes goes by the name of skeptical theism, in particular when this view is in the mouth of someone who's a theist and yet is at the same time trying to be skeptical too. Perhaps she's trying to have her cake and eat it too. And so the, the name goes um, skeptical theist, skeptical theism. Uh, the view is, is, is maybe coming back. I think it, there's, there's somewhat of a, a renewed interest in this kind of response to the argument from evil over the last decade or so. And roughly, it's just the view that God exists. That's the theistic part of skeptical theism. But it's also a claim about epistemic humility. We ought to recognize the limitations of our abilities to see and draw particular kinds of inferences when it comes to God and what God would do. And this is what skeptical theism is. So it's a kind of skepticism, and at least the skeptical theist hopes, that it can be contained or limited in the right sort of way. Now lots of people, as far as I can tell, hold a view like this. So here's a really early example. At least for my money, one of the clearest ways of reading the book of Job is to see the response to the problem of evil as a kind of appeal to skepticism. For those of you who don't know the story, Job is a righteous man. He's struck down with all kinds of tragedies. Terrible things happen to him. And his friends show up to console him. And his friends engage, as far as I can tell, in theodicy. They try to explain to Job why these bad things are happening to you. Oh, you must have done this, you must have done this. The evil serving this purpose or this purpose or whatever. And by and large, uh, his friends are refuted in the book. And the lesson seems to be, no one really can tell why these evils happen. So here's a quote. This is God speaking to, to Job. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It's higher than heaven. What can you do? It's deeper than Sheol. What can you know? This kind of response that says, evil is happening to you, but you're not in a position to figure out why. That's for the Almighty to know, 
and not for you. Here's an example of someone who's a philosopher. This comes from Descartes' Meditations. I think several ways of reading the Meditations lend themselves to a kind of skeptical, theistic reading. Descartes is worried with a number of different things, one of which is this question of how it is that humans can err, how it is that we can get false beliefs, given that we were created by this really good God. So this is a kind of instance of a problem of evil. How did we, why would God make beings that make mistakes? This is really interesting. Look at what Descartes says. It's no cause for surprise if I don't understand the reasons for some of God's actions, and there's no call to doubt his existence if I happen to find that there are instances where I don't grasp why or how certain things were made by him. This sounds like skeptical theism. He says, for since I now know that my own nature is very weak and limited, whereas the nature of God is immense, incomprehensible, and infinite, I also know without more ado that he's capable of countless things whose causes are beyond my knowledge. Last example. And this comes from uh, David Hume. Hume was very likely an agnostic, so not a theist, but he too holds a kind of skepticism about our ability to determine the ways of God. He writes, the great source of our mistake on the subject of God and of the unbounded license of conjecture which we indulge is that we tacitly consider ourselves in the place of the Supreme Being and conclude that he will observe the same conduct which we ourselves in his situation would have embraced as reasonable. In other words, we think, gosh, if I were God, I would have done something differently. And then we look around and say, but the world wasn't done that way, so there must not be a God. David Hume says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who are you to put yourself in the place of the Almighty and figure that what you would do in her seat is, you know, what she would do? You're not licensed to make that kind of conjecture. And this is the kind of thing that skeptical theists urge when we consider the argument from evil. We're not licensed to draw the kinds of conclusions that the atheist wants us to draw. So I want to close by quickly sketching some of the reasons that you might take this skeptical stance seriously and so, then some of the objections to it. I'll sketch four reasons that philosophers have offered for thinking that skeptical theism or something in that neighborhood is true. The first has to do with analogies. Suppose you're watching a chess match between two chess masters and one of the players sacrifices a, a particular piece. So sacrifices a, you know, a bishop. And not knowing a whole lot about chess, you think, gosh, I don't, why would you do it? Seems like a crazy move. I don't see any good that could come from sacrificing the bishop. From your inability to see a good reason for sacrificing the bishop, should you conclude that there is no good reason for sacrificing the bishop? Plausibly not. You know that the chess master knows way more about chess than you do. Your inability to see a reason for the move is not a good indicator that there is no reason for the move. <laughs> Here's another analogy. Um, my children, when they were young, didn't see a good reason for me to take them to the doctor's office and hold them down while they got shots. They couldn't imagine why that would be a good idea. Would it have been reasonable for them to conclude that there was no good justification, that there was no good reason for me to do that? Should they conclude that there is no good that could come from it? Again, given the cognitive distance between a parent and a child, the answer is plausibly no. But then the skeptical theist urges you to consider the same cognitive distance that holds between a human and God, if there is one. It will be vast. And so just as a child shouldn't make any inferences about her parent, so too we shouldn't draw these kinds of inferences about God. Here's a second example. A second kind of case or reason for taking skeptical theism seriously has to do with consequences. In particular, it has to do with the way that our world is wired such that seemingly trivial things can sometimes have drastic long-term consequences. From our short-term perspective, we can't see what's going on. It sort of looks like a mess. But were we able to back up and see the big picture, 
we would see how things fit together. And we're just not able to get that kind of perspective. Um, let me give you a, a kind of funny example of this from the philosophical literature. On the night that Winston Churchill was conceived, Lady Churchill could have gone to bed on her right side or her left side. Had she gone to bed on a different side, then given what we know about human reproduction, a different sperm would have made it to the egg, and if a different sperm had made it, Winston wouldn't have been born, someone else would have been born, and if Winston Churchill hadn't been around, World War II would have gone very differently than it did, and if World War II went very differently than it did, then it's plausible that actually none of you would be sitting here in this room. This is an example of the so-called butterfly effect, how really small things might sort of have a trickle-down effect um, that drastically affects how the future goes. Now, if you take this kind of thing seriously, it's very hard to see how any of us are ever in a position to see how one instance, one particular scenario, might be ultimately, if you will, good or bad. One thing that seems trivial and small might actually make all the difference in the world for our world going better or worse. And so given this kind of scenario about consequences, again, the skeptical theist urges us not to be so hasty to point to evils in the world and say that, in fact, they're pointless. We're just not in a position to tell. Third reason. This has to do, the third reason has to do with a, an epistemic principle that Professor Law mentioned um, in his talk yesterday. The idea that lacking evidence for something is evidence for its not being there only if you'd likely see that evidence were the thing there. So here's an example of someone looking at his hands. He might be wondering whether or not there are germs on his hands. You could look at your, ger your hands and say, hmm, are there germs on my hands? I don't see any, therefore there must not be any. You'd think that would be a bad inference. And the reason it's a bad inference is that even if there were germs on your hands, you know full well that you wouldn't see them. And so you're not seeing them isn't evidence that they're not there. But again, now consider evils and goods in the world. Take some given evil and you wonder to yourself, is that evil pointless? Is there some good out there that's connected to the evil, some good that would compensate for it? The skeptical theist says, look, even if it were there, they're like germs. You wouldn't see them, given that you have a three and a half pound brain. And so the mere fact that you can't detect them doesn't show that they're not there. So again, we should withhold belief on whether or not the evils in our world are gratuitous. Last reason to take the skepticism seriously. Suppose you've only met two Americans in your whole life. And um, suppose both of these Americans had certain traits. They wore cowboy hats, they ate burgers, they, you know, drank Miller Lite or whatever that is. So suppose you met only two Americans and they had certain features. Would you be licensed to conclude, you know what? Americans tend to wear cowboy hats, or Americans tend to eat burgers, or Americans are loud and ruckus or whatever. Look, if you've only met two, that doesn't really seem to ground some kind of general inductive inference about Americans in general. And what seems to be wrong here is you don't have a representative sample. In order to draw a kind of generalization, you would need a representative sample. A number of skeptical theists have pointed out that our situation vis-a-vis -vis evils seems to be the same. Think of your knowledge of the kinds of goods that there are. Think of your knowledge about the kinds of evils that there are. Think of your knowledge about the connections between goods and evils. Do you have any reason for thinking that your sample of goods and evils and connections is representative? If you don't have reason for thinking that your awareness is a representative sample, then how could you then go out in the world and find an evil and say, this one isn't connected with another good? You're not licensed to make that kind of inductive move because you're in no position to sort of verify whether the sample you're operating from is representative. And if it's not, all bets are off. So those are four reasons to take 
this kind of skepticism to the argument from evil seriously. Let me quickly outline three of the most serious objections to this kind of skepticism, and then I'd like to hear from you. Here's one objection. Skepticism about the argument from evil requires that God be like Machiavelli. This is a picture of Machiavelli. Saying the ends justify the means. When you meet someone who's skeptical about the argument from evil and you find some evil thing in their world, you say, but why would God allow that? The skeptical person says, well, we're in, we're in no position to tell. Maybe there's some good thing that comes out of it or whatever. And it seems like the skeptical person has to say that about every kind of evil, no matter how bad, rape, kidnap, murder, genocide, in principle, as long as God gets enough stuff out of it, she's justified in allowing a certain kind of evil. And some people think that's a moral mistake. You're making a mistake in ethics when you think about right and wrong in that way. Perhaps there are some things that are just wrong, period, full stop, should never be allowed, no matter what kind of stuff you get out of it. And it looks like that's going to be very hard for someone who's a skeptical theist to say. In principle, anything is okay as long as you can get enough good stuff out of it in the end. That sounds an awful lot like Machiavelli, and, and it may be surprising if it were to turn out that, that that's the way God reasons about these things. So that's an ethical objection to skeptical theism. There's also a worry that skeptical theism might undermine itself. This is connected with the skeptical worries that um, Professor Law mentioned yesterday. After all, the skeptical theist is willing to countenance these reasons that are out there that are not accessible to us. And if there are such reasons, might they undermine our own belief in theism or, or our own case for theism? So for example, what reason do we have for trusting divine revelation? If it's true that God could have reasons for deceiving us that we're in no position to identify. After all, a number of theists think that God has revealed herself, either through religious experiences or through text or whatever, but this kind of skepticism it's hard to keep it, if you will, within the box. It might bleed over into other areas of your life. And that seems like a serious worry for skeptical theists. Last objection. A number of philosophers think that skeptical theism promotes what you might think of as a kind of moral paralysis. It makes it difficult for these skeptical theists to reason and deliberate about what they ought to do. Let me give you an example. Suppose you're hiking and you come across a small child who's drowning in a pond. You, actually, you're hiking with a skeptical theist, even better. You're hiking with a skeptical theist out for a walk. She's explaining her view to you. And you see the small child drowning in a pond. And you say, quick, we have to help the small child. And as you go to rush in, your skeptical theist friend says, but wait. <laughs> for all we know, Maybe this child is going to be the next Hitler. Maybe God has these hidden reasons that we can't access for wanting certain things to, I mean, the idea is, if you can never sort of tell what's good or bad, how can you deliberate about your everyday moral actions? How can you know what you ought to do, how you ought to behave, and so forth? It seems that taking this kind of skepticism seriously might defuse a particular argument from atheism, but it might do so at the cost of being unable to act morally yourself. You just have to, your skepticism bleeds over into your everyday life. And if that's true, that's a very high cost to pay just to avoid a kind of argument from atheism. So in short, I hope that you have a clear view of why this problem of evil is a problem for particular theists, theists who believe in the kind of God of Michelangelo. I hope you have a clear sense of how to formulate that argument in clear assumptions that lead to the conclusion that atheism is true. And I hope then to have sort of provided a pro and con case for the skeptical kind of response to the argument from evil. And I invite your questions. Thank you.